nutritionists have always been pursuing sustainability by default. That's what we do, you know, uh, optimizing nutrient for whatever function uh, mm -hmm. in the most efficient, least wasteful way. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Poultry Podcast. My name is Jason Emmert, and today we're visiting with Dr. Sam Rochel, who is an associate professor of poultry nutrition in the poultry science department at Auburn University. Dr. Rochel received his bachelor's and master's degrees in poultry science from Auburn and his PhD from the University of Illinois. He was previously on the faculty at the University of Arkansas and returned to Auburn in 2022. His research focuses on defining nutrient and energy needs of broilers, assessing and enhancing feed ingredient utilization, and determining how nutrient needs and utilization are influenced by stressors such as heat and enteric disease. Dr. Rochel, welcome to the Poultry Podcast. Hey, Dr. Emmert. Uh, great, to, great to join you today. It's always uh, good to talk, and, and uh, now we'll get to opportunity to talk in front of in front of the audience. I really look forward. To you it. bet. You bet. And you've uh, you've done some hosting, so we're kind of flipping it on its head this time. And yeah, get to grill you a little bit. But yeah, definitely looking forward to that conversation. Yeah, yeah. No, it's neat. This is actually my first time as a guest, so so we'll yeah. see how it goes from this side. You bet. You bet. Well, to start off with, we'd like to hear a little bit about your academic journey. Kind of just tell us how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Sure. Well, you know, you kind of cover the high points in the background, but um, my academic journey actually did start here at, at Auburn University. So I did my undergrad and my master's here. Uh, I worked with Dr. Bill Dozier for my master's degree. And so got a lot of experience, um, you know, running uh, broiler four pin trials. And, and for my own research, um, I did a lot of uh, digestibility work, correlating uh, amino acid and, and energy uh, digestibility and utilization. Uh, kind of back to chemical components and characteristics of feed ingredients. Sure. And so uh, that was a lot of good practical experience and, and started to, to think in that, that world a bit. And so obviously, uh, Dr. Parsons was a, a leader and still is a leader there at the University of Illinois in, in nutrient digestibility and energy utilization. And so I had the opportunity to come to Illinois and uh, to work with uh, both Dr. Par Parsons and, and Ryan Dilger. And so uh, it was a great opportunity to kind of split my time between their labs. And uh, that was when I really uh, kind of dived into the, the nutrition health, uh, you know, focusing on um, mm -hmm. the, mainly digestibility, but also some post-absorptive uh, impacts of, of particularly coccidiosis. You mentioned enteric disease. That's the model that we generally work in, and I'll end mm -hmm. on that later. Uh, so I had that opportunity and, and really enjoyed that. And then um, after a few years at, at uh, Illinois, uh, I was able to join the faculty at University of Arkansas. And I was there about six and a half years and continued um, doing some of the, the same work that we started there at, at Illinois, but of course expanded into some other things. And um, about a year and a half ago, I had the op opportunity to come back to Auburn. Um, I, I love my time at Arkansas. It was great. I could not have asked for, for anything else, as you know, as a previous yeah. uh, in that department. It's a great place, great colleagues. Um, but, you know, it's hard to beat the, the opportunity to get home uh, where it all started. And yeah. uh, we have great facilities here at Auburn now as well. So um, that's been a, been a lot of fun, too. So um, that's kind of what, what got us here and, and where we are now. You bet. Evonik Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Evonik's focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. Talk a little bit about what it's like to go back to your alma mater. Uh, it, and I, I think especially after having some time away, sure, you know, to be able to return. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I always hoped that I would come back um, at, at some point. I didn't think it would be quite as soon as it was. Um, I would have liked to have a few more years at Arkansas for sure. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you never know when these opportunities are going to come up. So you kind of have to take them when they come. 
Uh, and I'm definitely glad I had an opportunity to kind of establish the lab somewhere else. And, yes. uh, you know, anytime, and, and I, this is advice for graduate students uh, as well, you know, when you can get to somewhere else, whether it be for just a visit or, you know, for one of your graduate degrees or even a first position, uh, you know, getting those networks at other places is, is huge. And uh, that, that was really foundational. Uh, for I think my my entire career um, those years at Arkansas, but yeah, it's been nice to be back. Um, you know, in addition to the things that you kind of care about, um, you know, from a big picture perspective, as far as mm -hmm. uh, efficiency and nutrient utilization and supporting the industry and making it more sustainable and efficient and economical, when you get to apply that to kind of your home state and and in the areas that you're working in, uh, that that mm -hmm. you know adds a little bit to it. And then obviously you get to to root for your lifelong uh, football team on on Saturday yeah. in the fall, so that's fun. <laughs> uh, yep, I can identify with almost everything you said except that last part. It's pretty tough here. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. But it, I mean, it's better than it was when I was there. So that's, that's true. Yep, yeah. that's true. I found too. Uh, it's it's been really fun, um, and something I hadn't anticipated getting to know faculty that I had as instructors. Yeah. Um, in a different way and yep. getting to know them as colleagues. And I've, I've really enjoyed that process. Yeah, that's been true uh, as well. You know, and it's, I mean, again, I, there were, there are still people here that were here when I was an undergrad, you know, mm -hmm. we had uh, guys on the farm that were here when I was doing my master's research. So that, that's a lot of fun. Um, you know, on the flip side, sometimes I think, man, they probably wonder, I can't believe this guy made it back here in this capacity, you know, and uh, I was a pretty decent student, but I could have done better, you know, as an undergrad, for sure. Things really kind of picked up for me, um, you know, once I got into my master's program and kind of saw the application and all that. But that's been fun um, for me as teaching undergrads here, you know, who people that come from kind of similar backgrounds that I did and say, hey, you know, you may think you'd never will need to understand this biochemistry class or the statistics right. class. Uh, but, you know, think about it in this way in the application. And so that's been kind of a, a passion project for me is, you know, trying to connect with those students and maybe help them see it a little bit earlier than, than I did. Uh, so, well, I'm sure there's a lot of pride. I mean, you know, we can, we kind of joke around about, it. I'm sure people that knew us when we were younger, are a little bit confused. How'd you get to this point? But exactly. <laughs> Right. But I, I also know from experiencing it on the teaching side now, the pride you have and, and people that you've worked with and seeing what they go on to do um, in academia. To me, that's one of the greatest rewards. And I'm sure in industry, too, if you get involved in mentoring people and get to help them in their career path, uh, those are just wonderful things. Very fulfilling. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm getting far enough uh, along in, mm -hmm. into it now that, you know, I'm starting to see some of that. You know, some of my graduate students are getting promoted or moving around and doing different things. So that that's yeah. really neat. Um, and, you know, even undergrads I've had, uh, you know, I just uh, one of my first undergraduate workers at Arkansas uh, reached out to me and he was recently hired uh, in the industry as a poultry veterinarian. He's already through vet school. Uh -huh. All that now so it's really neat to, to you know really start to see some of that you know come to bear and uh, you know a, a common acquaintance of ours who you know very well uh, yeah. now dr ben parsons is going to be taking my old position at arkansas so that's really neat to, to see that continue um as well so yeah it, it's really cool I, I always knew that was an objective that kind of brought me into this but mm -hmm. you know, really in the last year or so a couple of years you're really starting to see some of that that impact so that's that's really yeah cool. Yeah. Early years in academia, and it's just natural. You're focused pretty inward. I mean, you've got a certain amount of time, you know, to get things done. Uh, and then I feel like as you go through your career, you start to open up with that outward focus again. And, sure. and that's all, that's a normal part of the process, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I've, I've enjoyed that. Yeah. 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 I will say it's a whole different, and, and not that I started up from scratch um, here, but, you know, I was able to kind of take over some of the things that Dr. Dozier was previously doing. Uh, he's back on faculty now, but, yeah. um, you know, that, that shortened it a bit, but, you know, it's still kind of, uh, not totally back to that, that mentality of starting up again, but it's definitely been, you know, kind of intense in some ways the last year. So yeah. it's a lot of fun too. And, you know, you, you learn, I learned a lot the first time that made the second lab, uh, you know, a little bit easier and you already have some things in motion, but yeah, it's a, it's definitely a different mindset the first, first year or so for sure. You bet. You bet. 
Great. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get into some of the nitty gritty. Sure. So we have this area, and I and I have to tell you, um, and I you know I don't want to embarrass you, but um, you're really one of the models that I'm thinking of when I talk to students who are interested in nutrition and encourage them to learn as much as you can about the gut, learn as much as you can about gut health, because it really seems like that's that's a big part of the direction of where we're going and, and moving toward in the future is a greater understanding of that. And now, of course, we're dealing with some challenges that we hadn't had to deal with for a while and, and yep. dealing with, again, uh, new challenges always coming up. So, you know, with that really poor preparation, let's just get into that and kind of talk to us a little bit about that area of um, enteric health and and what that means for um, nutrient utilization, especially amino acids, energy. We'll just uh, get started with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I was fortunate. I think I had pretty good timing and, and you know, I, I got interested in this early. You know, I was there at Illinois uh, at 2012 to 2015. And so, you know, that was really on the front end. Um, and at that point, there were only a few people that were kind of, you know, focusing on this. I mean, uh, yes. Curtis Lacing was one of the ones who was, you know, he was kind of winding down at that point. But maybe the mm -hmm. 10, 15 years previous to that, he had been very active in uh, nutritional immunology and, and nutrition health. At that point, it wasn't so focused on the gut. I mean, he's done so much work just on, you know, inflammation, a lot of that through an LPS model and looking at how that impacts uh, nutrient needs. And so I was always pretty fascinated about that. Um, and then, you know, when you start thinking about different models and, and again, my background in digestibility and working there with Dr. Parsons, uh, Dr. Dilger had had a little work uh, experience as well with uh, mm -hmm. some challenge models and done a couple of COXI trials at that point. But you know, when you start looking at the diseases that really matter, um, you know, coccidiosis is, is a huge one. And so that was one that I focused on, um, you know, different things come and go, but coccidiosis is, is a constant, whether that's coming mm -hmm. through maybe a subclinical challenge, a mild challenge early on through the vaccine when we're vaccinating for coccidiosis or outbreaks, um, no matter what we're doing, that one is always there. And I think it's always going to be there. I mean, that was an issue even when we had uh, antibiotic growth promoters as a routine practice. And so yeah. you know, I kind of looked at that as job security and an opportunity to learn some things. And, and you know, interestingly, some of the neatest work that – and a lot of these papers aren't, you know, widely known, but, I mean, Dr. Baker was doing this stuff, you know, back in the 60s and 70s and looking at, you know, COXI challenges and, and amino acid responses. And so um, that was kind of what, you know, getting there, getting exposed to that, um, that was kind of what uh, tipped me off to this. And uh, I think it's been a, a good, um, a good fit and, and, you know, opened a lot of, a lot of doors and a lot of interesting questions on the flip side of that, you know, we still try to, and I've always tried to keep this at a, at a nutritional level as well. I mean, cause at the end of the day, you know, um, additives and, and different, specific challenges come and go, but, you know, the, the amino acid requirements, uh, and, and supply in the diet, the energy mm -hmm. supply in the diet and the phosphorus supply in the diet. Those are the three ones that are always going to make money or lose money in either a challenge bird or a healthy bird. And so, right. you know, keeping that at the forefront, um, because there's a lot of, when we talk about gut health, a lot of people, um, you know, look at that in different ways and, and you can, you know, get into that from a more immunology uh, based approach. Um, you know, the microbiome is a huge area that people are really, you know, we're learning a lot about. But, you know, my focus is, is still always kind of been around the, the nutrient utilization aspect uh, and how we can apply that practically in, in some degree. Great. Yeah. So what are what are we learning now or are there are there particular uh, challenges out there right now that are different? I, I don't necessarily want to say new, but are, are we see things gearing up in particular ways that are more challenging than what we've had to deal with before when we think about gut health and yeah. and diets? Yeah. I, you know, I think we have come a long way, really, even since I started. Uh, there at Illinois, I mean, you know, when people first started removing antibiotics here in the U.S., I mean, in Europe, this has been happening for a long time, which mm -hmm. uh, they can still use the ionophore anti uh, 
uh, which that goes a long way versus here if we're doing, you know, a, a raise without antibiotics or NAE, mm -hmm. not using those. Um, but it seems like we've kind of settled in a little bit. Um, you know, it was like this onslaught of feed additive research and, and we still have that and still need it. And looking at these combinations, I mean, you could spend an entire career looking at different combinations of feed additives uh, and what I will call, you know, non-nutritive feed additives that help with some of these uh, things. But it seems like that settled down a little bit. Uh, I think a lot of the big producers who tr made this transition you know, years ago are a little bit more comfortable now. Uh, but, you know, we always have uh, a lot of things that are probably uh, related back to the gut. I mean, when we think about um, kinky back and VCO, and we know that the gut uh, has an impact uh, on those as well. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we haven't, I haven't worked on those directly. I've collaborated with people, at, especially at Arkansas, working on those. So I think those are probably, uh, you know, we're starting to think more about um, the secondary effects a lot, I mm -hmm. think, versus just the direct challenge. Right. Uh, and then obviously necrotic still, you know, I, I feel like people have a little bit better handle, at least from what I can tell. I don't have data on this. This is just from talking with folks about you know, managing necrotic. Um, but that goes back to my earlier comment. Uh, we're doing some necrotic work now, but to me, understanding the the impacts of Coxy, because whether or not you ultimately get necrotic, uh, subsequent to that, um, you know, Coxy is always going to be there, probably at some some base level um, to some degree. So, um, I think that's kind of where we are now. Again, that's just kind of a uh, my my pulse. Um, on the issue without having specific data, but it seems like people are kind of getting comfortable with, with their programs and, and they vary a little bit in, in how they're doing it. Right. I think what's interesting in, in a lot of work is the separating or at least considering the, um, the things we can learn about it and then applying the economics to it. So what is, you know, what is economically important? What is economically feasible if we're thinking about any kind of prevention or, right. or treatment right. of any condition that we might be looking at? But is that something that, that you like to keep in mind as kind of the economic side and what, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you always want a potential solution to, to mm -hmm. have least uh, some end goal of a, mm -hmm. of a or some question I guess that has some end goal of a potentially economic economically feasible solution at the end of the day and so you know that's where um, sometimes you have to kind of balance um, you know what might be economical in the short term versus learning to, to get you to that step although it may not be economical at the at the moment and so you know, that's right. always the balance, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's an important part of, of doing applied, applied research. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think that's key to always keep in mind is, is you're developing, uh, experiments and research questions for sure. Right. And I think that's a, a challenge sometimes in our research conditions or in the settings, the type of trials that we can run is you, you, know, you can't always have the entire growth period, the entire cycle that you're looking at and, and thinking in terms of not just what's best during this short period, but how will this impact what happens later on, sure. um, but having facilities to be able to do that and even just having the data, understanding how to layer in the economics. It, it can be challenging challenging. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've been fortunate both here and at Arkansas to be able to run type of studies where we've done that a number of times. Look at, you yes. know, particularly under COXI vaccine models where we know that the challenge is going to be, you know, two to three week window of when the cycling is, is kind of um, at its peak, uh, depending on, on how you do it. Ours is generally a little bit earlier because of the model that we use. Uh, but nonetheless, we've been able to do trials where we, you know, look at the changes they are happening in the first two weeks and then able to track that until the end. But yeah, as you mentioned, those are expensive trials to run yeah. and it takes a lot of work and, and yeah, you have to, you, you really want to work hard to try to design something meaningful because it's, it's something that you want to capture the data when you do the experiment for sure. So, yeah. And I think that's where having a good background in experimental design is so important because uh, you, you get that wrong in the front end and now you're in it for six to eight weeks of, yeah. of uh, not getting out of it what you possibly could have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, I, I think I I probably place more emphasis on that. Uh, the, the more experience I get, I mean, you know, it's it's always important. You, you know, I've always thought about it as being important, but, you know, just 
understanding. Um, I guess it's easy to get quick to jump into something and you want to answer a, a question very quickly, but you know, the more time you can put in on the front, you know, experiments are made uh, in, in the design phase. You know, again, it goes back to uh, an, having a proper analysis rather than just an autopsy is, is statistical. Uh, statistic professors like to say, and, and I think that's very that's right. So what, where are we in our understanding of, of how some of these enteric challenges impacts uh, amino acid or energy utilization? And, and are there some broad things we can apply to, um, to amino acid protein utilization in general? Or sure. you know, how specific do we need to get looking at each in, amino acid individually? Yeah, no, that I think that's a really good question and, and uh, opens up a lot of questions. But, you know, yeah. to, to kind of provide a framework, I mean, I always look at when we have a disease challenge, of, let's say COXI, um, you know, I'm always thinking about the, the three big impacts. The first is going to be feed intake. I mean, if the mm -hmm. bird uh, undergoing inflammation, they're going to typically reduce their feed intake. So you're already losing some nutrients. I mean, we know that embroidered mm -hmm. intake drives uh, weight gain and, and performance and protein synthesis. So you've got the feed intake response. Mm -hmm. uh, then once the nutrients are consumed, you have the d digestibility impact. So what's happening you know, at the gut level. Um, and then once the nutrients are absorbed, you know, what changes, uh, have the uh, disease elicited, you know, post mm -hmm. and so, you know, those are the three kind of frameworks that I think about. Um, obviously, feed intake, we can track. You know, it would be very interesting. We don't do this often. We, we're doing it more in heat stress now. Uh, the work mm -hmm. that I, done, I had a PhD student that just uh, finished, uh, Jean-Rémy Tessier, has some really nice work on heat stress, and he did some pear feeding. But we haven't done as much. If you look in the literature, uh, there has not been as much uh, work done where they pear feed to really – separate, okay, what's the impact of just the feed intake alone versus the disease? Um, yes. so that's, that's a key thing. Um, you know, digestibility, we, I mean, I did some work there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wu Kim is doing a lot of work at Georgia um, as well. Mm -hmm. We've got several groups that have been working on the digestibility piece with different species of Imeria. And so we're mm -hmm. starting to, I think, learn more about which amino acids and the impact uh, and so yeah. that, that's interesting. Um, and, and I think we have that outlined a bit better now. Um, you know, it's hard to make broad generalizations. I mean, generally, um, you know, the sulfur amino acids, so cysteine is generally impacted pretty heavily. Uh, methionine mm -hmm. is really impacted on digestibility, arginine, threonine. Um, those that are, are important uh, drivers and pressure points for our feed formulations, those are some of the ones that are impacted the most. And so it, it's important to, to understand that. Um, then when you get into the post-absorptive side, you know, the kind of the third leg of that stool that I think about, we probably know much less there. Um, I mean, we know that the intestinal activity turnover, all of that increases. And so there's more demand at the intestine level for mm -hmm. uh, regenerating the structure and functionality. Um, and then, you know, what's happening? Uh, I mean, Coxie, we think about it as an intestinal and I think it is, uh, but there's still some post-absorptive effects. I mean, we've shown, you know, differences in plasma amino acid concentrations acute phase proteins, um, overall protein synthesis and breakdown. And so those things do occur. Uh, generally, if it's, a, if it's more subclinical, we hope that we don't see extreme responses post-absorptively, but surely uh, there are impacts there. And we probably know less about that than we do um, about the other. But I think that, um, you know, we, we still have more to learn. Um, another thing that I keep coming back to, and we published a, a review paper, uh, Trevor Lee was the first author, a former PhD student on this. I think that paper mm -hmm. was in 21, um, around that time, but, uh, part of, a you know, kind of collectively looking at this work. And if you look back at, at all of the work around, you know, coxie challenges, um, and just protein and just take amino acids out of it. So mm -hmm. either crude protein or essential amino acid, you know, using crude protein just as a proxy for essential amino acid. Generally, the bird responds pretty well when we increase crude protein and when you look at feed efficiency. And so mm -hmm. 
you know, what you have to be careful about is, again, that's looking at that one challenge in isolation, um, and which I strongly believe that more amino acids generally favor the bird. Um, and not talking about specific amino acids, functional amino acids, just higher amino acid density. That's a benefit. What we have to be careful about in the field, and this is, again, where uh, taking research in the lab to the field is, obviously, you know, if you're increasing protein and, and amino acid density, uh, you may be increasing indigestible nitrogen, depending on how that protein is increased. And so then yeah. that leads more to the secondary, you know, bacterial issues, necrotic enteritis, just general dysbiosis. So that's something that we still have to probably learn a little bit more about um, how those are connected. And it's a bit of a paradox there, but, um, you know, I think that's where what's great amino acids that presents an opportunity when we know that the digestibility is high, highly digestible ingredients. Certainly you don't want to do that with poorly digestible ingredients. So um, I think that's a, you know, kind of where we are there. And so just learning exactly how much and when, um, I think we're still a long ways when we talk about, you know, specific functional amino acids, like we can increase ratios. I mean, I think I personally believe in the data show that increasing three and ratio a bit generally helps uh, depending on what your starting point is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but beyond that, looking at targeted amino acids during specific challenges, I mean, that right. um, we see successes through that, but that, that one, I think we're still a little bit from, from implementing in the field economically for sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many things to think about. Sure. Uh, and so uh, let me throw this one out there too. Now, if we add uh, heat to yeah. the equation yeah. and some heat stress, um, what are we learning about combinations of some of these things and enteric challenges with yeah. heat? Right, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that that's a really interesting one. And we know that, um, I, I guess, from work that we've done, you know, we know there are direct impacts of these enteric challenges. We know that there's direct impacts of heat stress. We have not combined them yet. Uh, certainly, we've we've thought about that, um, but yeah, you know, the heat stress is another interesting thing. As I mentioned, I had uh, Dr. Tessier, a, a previous PhD student who just finished working a lot on that, and interestingly, you know, the amino acid density that we see the benefits in the coxy didn't seem to help, at least in the same way in his his st heat stress model. Again, it, mm -hmm. it's very model specific whether you're doing chronic yes. or cyclic. He's doing this in chronic, so the birds are impacted you know, uh, to a pretty, pretty severe extent. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be careful there. But yeah, um, I guess, you know, it, kind of the, the longstanding uh, hypothesis with heat stress is lower protein because protein has a high heat increment. Um, but mm -hmm. when we look at the data, that, that really has not been successful. And I mean, he, he did a nice job showing that. I think theoretically it still makes a lot of sense. And if you look at the old experiments, you can probably point out where they didn't balance their amino acids correctly when they reduced protein. And so I think that could probably be at play there. But, um, right. you know, and again, I'm, I'm kind of newer to the heat stress, so I'm, I'm less confident in, in uh, where we're going with that than, than you know, my experience with the, the Coxy part for sure. Yeah, it is so challenging because you think about even just basic studies on heat stress, the the model you use, how you approach it, the length of time, the yep. age of the bird. Oh, my oh, goodness. Yeah. There's so yeah. many decisions to make. Yeah, those and those things have a huge impact. And so his he actually has published this. But, you know, the first thing we did was just look at the different models. It, mm -hmm. it, and not all, but, you know, he looked at a cyclic versus chronic and you, you get totally different responses. I mean, yes. And so, you know, then the question becomes, do you are you trying to really model it and, and stress the birds to see what might work? Or do you want to get what's more field relevant and, and look at this cyclic approach? Um, so, yeah, it, a lot of a lot of questions there um, and, and both, you know, enteric models um, or under heat stress. I mean, Coxie, there are a lot of different ways. You can look at single species. You can look at multiple species. You mm -hmm. can look at field strains, vaccine strains, uh, the timing of the age. You know, in general, uh, most of our literature uh, has been around, you know, uh, historically acute challenges around the 14-day period. And then you look at that uh, initial response. But, you know, what happens in the field is, you know, generally there's going to be a long exposure and you know even when birds are, are uh, cycling vaccine they're going to initially pick up some oasis and then cycle a couple more times as they develop immunity 
And there's disparity in the flock of, of how that happens. It gets asynchronous, and that's where we, we see some issues. Um, but, you know, we, we typically model it where we inoculate the birds individually and it synchronizes it. We can time that mm-hmm. sure. attitude a little bit better. But, yeah, these are all things that the model is, is everything. And, and that's what I encourage people when you're looking at the literature. You know, yeah, you can say this dietary intervention worked or not, but you have to understand the model. Does that represent something that in the field might translate to a benefit uh, for what your birds are actually under, undergoing? So that, right. that's huge. Yeah. Well, part of the part of the purpose of my probing kind of uh, along the uh, the lines of how complex it is, is to ask you this, which I, I don't think we know. So this is probably not a fair question. But if, <laughs> if we think about how complex all of these things are and the timing and the models and just you name it, uh, how important do you think it might be in the future to begin thinking about using AI and I'll be specific. I'm talking about artificial intelligence now to begin looking at all the different work that's been done, because I think maybe that's an opportunity to analyze from different models and timing and all the approaches in a way that is just very difficult for us to do without that. No, I I think we're getting there, uh, getting closer. You know, I know there's Mm -hmm. still some challenges. I mean, um, ultimately, I think the AI models are probably way ahead and our ability to develop good models are ahead mm-hmm. of the actual sensors and the hardware to collect the data needed to make the decisions. I mean, I'm no expert in this area. Uh, I may be completely wrong about that, but in my conver- I actually just had a recent conversation with someone very active in this field. And, uh, you know, they mentioned the biggest bottleneck right now are sensors that uh, you know, regardless of what type of data you're collecting, you know, sensors that are environmentally um, uh, reliable, uh, reliable yeah. in the environments that they're in to collect the data accurately to make. So it's all about the input, you know, garbage, in, garbage out. And, That's right. You know, but I, I think we're definitely there. And, you know, that to me, the hardware piece, I mean, the engineers will continue to to fix that and that will move very quickly. And then, yeah, I think we're, we're definitely on the verge of being able to, to mesh the, the biologists with the, the engineers and the data science people to really, you know, make yeah. on farm, you know, changes that are strategic. And, and um, I think that's pretty exciting. Oh yeah. And then if we throw the, the animal welfare aspect in there, yeah. um, because so many times, and we talked about it a little bit earlier from an economic standpoint, we'll think about things that, okay, we know maybe, maybe this impacts the bird in this way, but there's no real economic outcome to that. But I think, and it's challenging, but I think moving forward, uh, you know, we have to, we have to think about the e- economics of, animal welfare issues that may not have been a concern before, just from the standpoint of, uh, you know, it's not impacting efficiency or maybe it's not impacting uh, um, our ability to produce product in, a, in an efficient way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, consumers are, as we know, and have been for a while, increasingly interested in different aspects of, of welfare. That's, that's an area I find very challenging is how now to put an economic value on some of those consumer considerations. Um, and yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's something that you think about as well, or you know, just yeah. another layer. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, the welfare and sustainability aspects are both critical now. And yeah. um, not that they haven't always been, uh, mm-hmm. I think, you know, good uh, animal producers, uh, farmers, I, I, you know, I firmly believe that that's always, animal welfare has always been uh, yeah. at the forefront, even if that may not have been expressed in the same terms that we're using now. Right. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, capturing that and, and then a way to make decisions on that. I mean, we have uh, Dr. Bethany Baker Cook here mm-hmm. in our department. She's actively working on, on AI to monitor animal welfare. A lot of different places are, are working on this. Yeah. Um, so we're going to see it. And I mean, the sustainability thing, we, we, you know, again, nutritionists have always been pursuing sustainability by default. That's what we do, you know, uh, optimizing nutrient for whatever function uh, mm-hmm. in the most efficient, least wasteful way, you know, but we haven't always talked about it in, in those particular terms that we're using today. Um, but, that, you know, that being said, I mean, that's, you know, I just got back from a conference, um, you know, 
uh, around, uh, you know, particular feed ingredients uh, in different parts of the world. And it's like sustainability is core for these customers, you know, the, and in yeah. places where, you know, they're still um, developing their industries who are nowhere mature as ours, but they're, they're doing that um, with sustainability in mind, not, okay, let's grow our industry and then we'll think about sustainability, you know? So it, it's coming, I think, very early. Uh, in some of these markets. And so that, that's very huge. And, and, and all of this, um, you know, kind of kind of comes together uh, back to these basic questions around, you know, the same diseases and, you know, enteric diseases and heat stress and things that we've been facing and are going to continue to face probably to a greater degree. Um, you know, it's important to understand how that fits uh, with, with these other aspects for sure. It is. It is an interesting thing. I, I think that we're seeing more of is uh, in, in some in different parts of the world more than others. But, you know, a push to use additional alternative ingredients, whether it's food waste or, or coming from other, uh, you know, other byproduct streams. And I find it that really compelling. Uh, but at the same time, one of the greatest challenges for a nutritionist is not knowing what's in an ingredient and the variability that comes along with that presents, uh, presents a lot of challenges. But sure. that, again, is where I think some uh, some artificial intelligence technologies may be helpful moving forward as they can uh, analyze products from different streams and really think more of how to quickly real time incorporate those into diets. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, and, and you know, the other factor that you always have to consider is quantity. I mean, is it available yes. in sufficient yeah. quantities where, yeah. you know, I can, I can make uh, actual decisions around this ingredient? Um, I, again, at this conference I was just at, I had uh, one of the speakers uh, quoted uh, Steve Leeson. I haven't looked this up, but, you know, he mentioned there's really no novel feed ingredients. They may be novel to you, but if you look globally, there are only 19 or 20 feed ingredients that are produced in sufficient quantities yeah. you know, to, to actually be able to use in a commercial operation. And so, Absolutely. Um, you know, they may be novel uh, to you, but they're probably not novel uh, to, to everyone at this point. But, you know, that is changing every day. We hear these new things and, and I'm excited about these. And, uh, you know, I don't necessarily think that just because we can't produce enough now is is reason to, to discount it. And I understand it may not be of interest to someone who's formulating today, uh, but that's where, you know, I think at the university, it's our job to spend maybe more time thinking about those things that, that aren't necessarily they can't prioritize at the moment for what might be coming down the road. Yeah. Well, that's the great thoughts. I really appreciate that. And before before we move to kind of the final you know piece here, where we get your thoughts on some resources. Um, I did want to acknowledge because I really appreciate what you said a, a minute ago about producers have always cared about animal welfare. This is not yeah, a yeah. new concern. It's not a new a new area of focus for anyone. Uh, I think what we're seeing though is that just that we're learning more. We're learning oh, yeah. more about um, even what a what a bird experiences, yep. um, how they interact with their environment, and so that to me is what really presents us with new opportunities. Yeah, not that it's an awakening that we find care yeah. about the birds it's uh, uh just new knowledge that yep. we can apply yep no absolutely i agree and uh like you say it's just learning and a lot of it is just terminology and rephrasing things mm -hmm. that we've yeah. already been thinking about to, to uh, a great extent so that's right that's right well, great want to want to be uh, respectful of your time sure. uh, well first ask any anything else kind of on the research side that that you wanted to share didn't want to close the book on that too soon if there's anything yeah. else you want no, I mean I think the only thing you, you mentioned about energy and we didn't really talk yeah. about that um, I, I would say there's there are some really exciting things um, around energy and coccidia yeah. that we can look at um, and energy and heat stress too I mean uh, so bo both of these areas, um, I think, are, are very exciting. It's a very dynamic time when we talk about energy. Um, you yeah. know, we have a lot of, of our traditional energy sources being diverted to biofuels, and that's only going to increase. And so energy mm -hmm. is very expensive. Um, always has been very expensive, but certainly is the case right now. And uh, I think the exciting thing is, is you know, this is, again, going to open up doors to, to new sources and, and uh, different ways of 
of uh, thinking about formulation. At the same time, you know, when we talk about broilers, I, you know, I think they're probably less sensitive than they've ever been, certainly to dietary energy. I mean, they still right. respond to right. energy, uh, but certainly not to the magnitude, in my opinion, that we see as responses to amino acids. Uh, so it's a very dynamic time thinking about energy. But when we talk about coccidiosis, you know, I would say we're lacking there for sure. Uh, compare with amino acids. Not that we have it all figured out on amino acids, but um, there's some pretty interesting things that have been done, but I think there's some some real opportunity because when you look at the magnitude of impact on, you know, energy utilization versus amino acid utilization, energy gets hit you know, proportionally uh, much greater than amino acids. And so um, there's also some older data that indicate there's some things we can do with sources and, and different things to try to, to mitigate that. So um, that's something that I, I've touched on a little bit um, in our lab, uh, but haven't had the opportunity to do as much as I want, but kind of gearing up to do more of that. So, yeah, yeah, energy, important area. I guess the thing we haven't looked at seems like an obvious solution is just to develop electric chickens, but we're, <laughs> not, right. we're, we're not there that's yet. Right. Not quite, yeah. Not quite. yeah, well, we're used to talking about energy challenges, but I'm pretty confident that's not a direction we're going to be able to go. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to think in other, other terms. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's time for our famous three. Eastman serves veterinarians and nutritionists in agrochemical and animal health industries by helping them select, evaluate, and implement innovative nutritional programs. Eastman works with your team to customize your gut health approach in feed and water. Eastman's approach addresses nutritional and bacterial challenges and finds new ingredient preservation and hygiene solutions. Explore ways to accelerate and innovate your programs. Contact the animal nutrition team at eastman.com. All right. Well, as, as we uh, wrap up, have those questions we'd like to ask you. Yeah. And first of all, i uh, like to see if you have a favorite poultry related book or resource, anything that's a go to for you out there. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, you, you kind of mentioned these questions before, and, and I'll, I'll admit that I didn't fully prepare, but it's easy because I keep a couple, you know, the, of the core ones right right beside me here that for, for easy, uh, easy access. But, uh, you know, obviously the Scott's Nutrition of the Chicken, uh, the latest version that, that Dr. Leeson uh, and Summers yeah. worked on, that, that's one that continues, even though there's newer ones, that, w- that one still continues to be my go-to for just mm-hmm. quality nutrition. Um, and then there's the book, um, Nutrition Experiments and Pigs and Poultry. I actually have a copy. I'll give a oh, I'll yeah. show that here. This is a, a great book edited by uh, Dr. Bedford, Dr. Chalk, and Dr. O'Neill. Um, that's an awesome one for graduate students. If, if you're a graduate student in, in animal nutrition and you don't have that, you need to get a copy of that. All of these things about how to evaluate energy um, amino acid digestibility, the type of diets that we use, how we design experiments. That, that book is, is a great uh, resource for understanding some of that. Absolutely. And if you're into research, I mean, it, you should enjoy looking through that because you can just learn so much and, and it's information you need to know. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, how about a non-poultry resource or even, even something for funds or something, you know, that yeah. you you like to read or listen to or watch for fun? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, you can see the pictures. Uh, I have some uh, some fish, at least one fish picture behind me. I mean, and, and that's a, kind of a driver for me as far as nutrition because everything that we do impacts our water quality. And so I always yes. kind of keep that at the forefront um, as, as far as a, a personal motivation. Um, so, yeah. you know, obviously that's a, that's a big part for me. Um, as far as reading you know, there's a lot of different things that, that I try to I try to always be reading one or two books outside of poultry nutrition at any one time, yeah. out of a mix between uh, history and, and uh, you know, often a, a lot of, you know, things to, to be a bit more efficient. Um, it's hard to nail, nail one down. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I'll say the important thing is is to seek those things out. I remember yes. joking like, when I finished graduate school and kind of started reading a, a bit more again, it was like, man, this is the first thing I've read that didn't start with an abstract in a long time. And, <laughs> yes. You know, don't, don't let that go. Even if you can't find time to, to read, you know, every day, I think that's important to, to think about in graduate school because it's easy to lose. Is that? 
It is. And, you know, it just, just keeps the brain going. I, I just finished an autobiography of Agatha Christie. And yeah. I really don't need to know anything about life and, you know, late Victorian England. Right. But it was just very interesting. Oh, I, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Helps yep. to get your mind off the other things so that when you come back to poultry nutrition, you're you're fresh, you're ready to go, kind of yeah. energized. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and just to, to place that, you know, everything we're doing, I, I mean, is in the bigger context. So we design very, you know, defined experiments to answer small questions. But again, mm -hmm. it's all in the bigger context of, of how yep. we're eating and feeding people. And so yes. that's a huge age old question uh, that's defined by a lot of different, you know, uh, aspects and other than just the science and biology. I mean, that's a political, uh, it's yeah. been religious. I mean, everything influences yeah. what we eat and how we think about our food system. So it's very, that's important. right. That's right. Well, great. Well, last question then, um, anything you'd want to share as far as advice and you've already, you've, you've shared some previously, uh, but any advice out there for people who maybe want to get into the poultry industry or academia, uh, just, yeah. What, what would you like to share? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just, it, it's an awesome, and, and people say this all the time. It's an aw awesome opportunity to oh, you know, uh, be in the industry and, and information. I mean, it's incredible. Like as a graduate student, you know, I mentioned the, the Scott's nutrition book. I mean, that was, I guess the resource that I still lean on because that's what I had. I mean, there were others out there, you know, several good books, but there were no really, certainly no poultry nutrition podcasts at that point. Right. Um, That's right. You know, I mean, obviously Google Scholar was there um, but still like the access and ease of information is, is mm -hmm. important. Uh, I guess throughout that, you know, the the advice I would give is don't rely solely on those things. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, you want to hear me uh, or a guest or whoever talk about a certain topic. Uh, that's great. But, you know, don't take my word for it or anyone else's word for it. You know, you've got to get back to the primary literature. And, and dig in and start to develop your own ideas. Um, yeah. so that's, that's the most important thing, I think, particularly for graduate students, you know, is, is yeah. again, uh, earlier we were, we were suggesting to read stuff outside of poultry. The biggest thing I think you can do as a graduate student is, is read the literature. I mean, that's, you know, they always say a, a month in the library will save you a year in the lab. And that's, that's definitely true. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And to realize that, uh, that the record of literature doesn't begin two years ago. Oh, you yeah. Know, you talked yeah. earlier about looking back to some of Dr. Baker's work in the 60s and 70s. And there's some there's some really fundamental uh, stuff out there that it's, it's good to be familiar with. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it's tough now because there are so many journals, you know, there are more yes. journals popping up. Um, and so it, it's really hard to, to keep a handle on it. And it, and it gets progressively harder. That, that's another thing that I tell graduate students, mm -hmm. too. It's like you feel busy. And, and I hated it. I hated it as a graduate student when people said this. And you are busy as a graduate student, for sure. But it's so hyper focused and narrow into just yeah. what you're doing. And, you know, yeah. there's one time in life where you have that opportunity. And so, you know, take advantage of it because it gets harder to, to know as much as you're going to know about that uh, on yeah. anything else ever again, you know. That's right. That's right. Yep. And building on that skill of um, becoming increasingly efficient. So being able to look at more things, but to look quickly and to get yeah. out of it what you need to to get out of it, probably a, a skill well worth working on for all absolutely. of us. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, Dr. Sam Rochel, we sure appreciate your time today. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. It's been a great conversation. And uh, yeah, I definitely encourage everyone listening. Um, check out Sam's Google Scholar page, uh, links to some really great articles and I will say great reviews, which I find to be so helpful because if you're feeling lacking in any particular area, when you can find a good review that, that provides some education, some insight into that area in general, it's just so, so helpful. So thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. Appreciate that. You bet. Hey, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. It, it really uh, appreciated being on this side and, and you did a great job uh, working through it and great questions. And so I hope mm -hmm. some of that was helpful and I, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, thanks again. And thanks to everybody out there listening and we'll, uh, we'll catch you next time. Take care.